the whole way of educating people by not communicating with them in a real, honest, powerful, loving way is ineffective today. Methods that some of us thought were excellent and impeccable are turning out to be a mockery and futile and ineffective, at least for many. I can't say for everybody, but for many. In generally, in general, today you have to treat children not so much like children. We treat nine-year-olds as though they were babies. Today already at six, they're teenagers. Seven-year-olds no more than the 90-year-old grandmothers. This doesn't mean children are not children, but it means treat your nine-year-olds with deep intelligence and respect because they understand everything. <laughs> Never mind your 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds. Talk to them. Listen to them. Communicate with them. Go out of your space and go into their space. Spend time with them on their terms, not on your terms. A father comes to me and he says, my son doesn't want to spend time with me. I said, okay, I also don't like spending time with you. What's the problem? <laughs> I didn't say that. I just thought it. I'm like, I was thinking, like, I'm waiting for this meeting to be over, so I don't blame your son. I'm like, well, what type of time do you offer your son to spend with you? He says, I always ask him to learn with me, and he never wants to. I said, oh, yeah, kids, very, a lot of kids don't like learning with their father. He says, that's a problem. I said, okay, but what does your child love? He says, I don't know, he loves sports. I say, for example, does he love horseback riding? He says, oh, he's crazy about horseback riding. I said, why don't you go horseback riding with your son once a week? He says, that's not education. I want to learn with him. I said, one day, but first bond with him. Become close. Your child needs a father. Go horseback riding with him once a week. He says, that's bitl Torah. It's, it's, it's wasting time of Torah. I said, listen, that's my advice to you. Start going horseback riding with him once a week for a good few hours, and you'll build, you'll build a trust language. So he tells me, I cannot take responsibility for such a sin, to waste time of Torah and go horseback riding. I said, I have an idea. When you die and come to heaven, and they'll want to punish you for going horseback riding with your son, say, it was Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson's advice. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you why. I'm anyway going to hell. I know you're going to paradise. I'm going to hell anyway. So they'll add this. They'll add this, that I told you to go horseback riding with your son. It's not the end of the world. In fact, maybe that will be my paradise. Maybe that will, that's what I'll get paradise for. That you spent some time with your son. You gave your son a little, a little bit of fatherly love, fatherly trust. He says to me, you're serious? I should say this in heaven. I looked at him, I said, you know, if I was your son, I also wouldn't want to spend time with you. You'll forgive me. Stop analyzing and stop dissecting. Go spend time with your child. You created a certain model of what a relationship looks like completely on your terms. You know nothing about your son. You know nothing about his life. You know nothing about his interests. You know nothing about his heart. You don't have a child. You have an imaginary child that you created in your own image. That's not your boy. Why don't you learn who your boy is? Because you don't want to learn who your boy is. Because it's not the boy you dreamt about. Well, guess what? Life is about reinventing yourself every day for what God wants. I want to share something with you and end with this. There was a boy who went to Vietnam to fight. He survived. He called up his father Thursday, and he says, Dad, I arrived in California from Vietnam, the army base. I can come home on Monday. Wow, son, amazing. Dad, one request. My best friend in my platoon, he stepped on a mine. He lost an arm. He lost two legs. He has no family. We're best friends. Can I bring him home with me? Take care of him. Father says, son, that would be a big mistake. You know, 
we're going to be nice to him on the outside, but inside we're going to resent him. He's going to make our lives miserable. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult. He says, Dad, I promise you, you're going to love this boy. He is the sweetest, brightest, most charming kid in the world. You're going to love him. He says, son, I don't have a doubt that I'm going to love him. But internally, I'm going to hate him. Internally, I'm going to be miserable because he's living in my home. This is not my responsibility. It's the government's responsibility. They will put him in a home that can help him. They will pay for him. You can go visit him. But this is, we don't want such a person in our home. It's really not going to work. Your mother and your father are going to despise it. I'm telling you the truth. He says, Daddy, thank you. Hung up the phone. So that Sunday, the father gets a call. It was the police. And the police said that there was a soldier who came back from Vietnam. And he took his life over the weekend. He jumped off a roof. They think he may be related to him. If he could come identify the body. So he came. And he identified the body. It was his son. And he saw that his son was missing the arm. And the two legs. His son was not talking about his best friend. He was talking about himself. This is a story someone sent to me. I'm not here to judge anybody in the world, especially not a person who has his own challenges. And as the Mishnah says, never judge anybody until you don't reach their space. Until I don't wear somebody else's shoes, I don't judge them. And since I never wear anybody else's shoes, I barely fit into my own shoes, I don't judge anybody. But this story taught me a lesson, and I'll tell you what it is. Sometimes we're ready to accept the children that look like the children we hoped we're going to have. We're ready to accept our loved ones as long as they fit into the mold of what my student, my child, my grandchild, my daughter, my son, my teenager is going to look like. As long as you fit into that mold, I'm here for you. I love you. I'll do everything for you. I'll pay for your yeshiva. I'll pay for your college. I'll pay for your university. I'll marry you off. I'll pay for you to learn in Kailu for 29 and a half years. As long as you look like the one that I need you to look like. So I could sit down and say, ah, I have nachas from you. The moment my child looks different, the moment my child is on a different journey, suddenly the worst in us comes out. I have no space for you. Some parents will throw their children out of their homes. Some parents will keep their children in their homes, but they will resent them, and they will have only a negative attitude towards them. But there comes a time in your life when I say to you, ask not what your child can do for you. Ask what you can do for your child. And ask not how everything fits into your picture or my picture. My question has to be, how do I transcend my comfort zones and say, I'm going to be here for you? I know it hurts, and I know it's painful, and I know it's not the journey I wanted, and I know it's not the journey that I expected. But let me tell you something, my dear friends. If you go on this journey, it's not only your child who will be saved. You will also be saved. It's not only your child who will find a new life. As hard as it is to believe, you will also discover a part of yourself and a part of God that you never knew about. Thank you very much.